Jimi Hendrix closed the festival with a set at 9 a.m. Monday, August 18, 1969. Hornetel wrote Back to the Garden, the story of Woodstock. As good as the first part of the set was, there was nothing in any of it to suggest what was about to come next. Without any warning, your ears tell your brain that you're hearing the opening notes of one of the most familiar, one of the most played, one of the most sung songs in the nation's history, the Star Spangled Banner. Your ears are also telling your brain that, depending on your politics, you are hearing one of the most profane or one of the most profound versions of that song that you have ever heard. It is searing, it is soaring, it is stirring, it is majestic, it is mocking, it is shocking, it is appealing, it is appalling, it is calming, it's alarming. It is Jimi Hendrix playing the Vietnam War on the strings of his white solid body electric guitar with taps thrown in for good measure. film, which turned out to be one of the biggest films for Warner Brothers that year and probably still the biggest grossing documentary ever, was an afterthought. Joel Rosenman co-produced the Woodstock Festival. It seemed like such an imaginary idea until we got much closer to the festival. And when I say much closer, I mean Wednesday of, the, of that week. Same old story for Woodstock. The documentary, Woodstock, released in 1970, and singer-songwriter Richie Haven saw its effect far and wide. I went to South America, to Rio, and the movie had just come out there. In one week later, they had their own Woodstock, and it was bigger than ours. They just went for it, you know. Over the years, many Woodstock-inspired festivals appeared. Woodstock co-producer Michael Lang. There's a festival that goes on in Poland that started in 1994 by a gentleman and his daughter. And they told me that their first encounter with Woodstock was when they were still behind the Iron Curtain and heard about the festival happening, and it empowered them in their struggle. It just demonstrates that anytime people can come together in, in a peaceful, positive way, uh, and set an example anywhere in the world. It sort of translates to everywhere else in the world. The apologies of America, apologies of America, apologies of America, apologies of America. According to festival co-producer Joel Rosenman, Woodstock helped close the proverbial generation gap, for a while anyway. The older generation watched kids get together in mud, chaos, disarray, and there was a lot of tut tutting about it and how wasn't this just like the younger generation? And I think the New York Times called it Nightmare in the Catskills. I said people think because my daddy did these things They said that I've got to wear a child and going to be the same But very soon after that, the same event was characterized as a miracle at Bethel. The difference was that the older generation watched the younger generation pull itself together. They built a community. That community functioned. It took care of itself. It took care of its neighbors. It was responsible to all of the needs that arise in more or less difficult circumstances. The older generation was impressed that this younger generation, which they had previously thought maybe didn't have the maturity or the wisdom or the consideration for others, they suddenly felt this was a generation worthy of respect. And they started listening to what that generation had to say. I think that there was a, a new respect on both sides, both generations, and a new exchange of ideas. That led to some pretty significant changes in the 1970s. Well, you can 
chicken rack cup, man. Who thought it was a lot of chicken at the hot cup? Woodstock founders Michael Lang and Joel Rosamond continue the spirit of the festival in today's gathering place, the web. Woodstock never seems to lack for attention. And so the temptation is that we'll be a soapbox for all kinds of issues. Joel Rosamond. We resisted that temptation in 1969 when we did the festival. We were specific about how we didn't want anybody to get up and make this a public speaking place for their particular political point of view. Nevertheless, a point of view emerged, and I expect the same will be true for Woodstock.com. Yeah, right, yeah. Michael Lang. I think we hope that the site becomes a very useful tool for people to make a difference in their lives, in their daily lives, and sort of the lives that we're projecting for our kids and the planet that we leave behind. And in that regard, it, it will involve music, it will involve lifestyle, it'll involve sustainable development ideas, it'll involve ways to get involved in those issues. I think that the desire for people to come together and communicate and bond and relate is as strong now as it ever was. I think it's just an innate human desire and quality. I'd like them to come away with the conviction that they can make a difference, that they can make that difference in conjunction with everyone else who's in their community, and that they can find that community on Woodstock.com.